see you already that uh, webinar. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that uh, people could uh, watch it and then to know uh, uh, 12 of your publications, I think that are incorporating this work. Um, okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the ZGU Earth Data webinar. Today is our great, great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Mass Collinet speaking with us. So Mass uh, uh, got his uh, undergraduate degree and uh, master's from Belgium before he worked on his PhD at MIT, uh, working with Tim Grove. Uh, is that right? And and then um, uh, uh, he has moved to uh, Germany, uh, working at the German Aerospace Center. Uh, as a postdoctoral researcher. So his research has been focusing on, on um, high temperature experiments, uh, the meteorites, et cetera. And today he's going to tell uh, the works, especially for the modern work that have been working on, uh, uh, on uh, to figure out the Martian mantle compositions. So with that, I will give the rest down to Max. So normally our talk goes for about 40, 45 minutes, but it's very flexible. And please leave some time for our participants to interact. Uh, in general, our webinar ends at about 60 minutes. So uh, with that, Max, please. Well, thank you very much, Cheng Xiao. And I'm very pleased to be here uh, remotely, of course, and talk to you about some of my recent research uh, related to Mars. And I know my title might be a little bit cryptic so I wanted to start by um, yeah uh, clarifying a little bit what my presentation will be about so essentially it's a summary of two recent papers uh, one that was published already and one that we just submitted the first paper um, is uh, a description of the the new model that we uh, put together uh, it's um, designed really to simulate partial melting in the Martian mantle and we call it uh, magmars just for magma in mars it's not not really an acronym it's just <laughs> just that um and in the first paper there's one small application uh, a lot of the um, applications um are in the upcoming papers um and that i'm happy to share a preprint of if anybody is interested after the talk and so in that paper we really tried to use uh, the composition of martian basalts uh, to constrain the temperature in the Martian interior, uh, so the thermal state of the mantle over time, and also um, the composition of those regional mantle sources that are sampled by uh, specific Martian basalts. So why can we do that? Um, well, uh, basalts in general, uh, as you know, but uh, maybe primitive basalts in particular are witnesses of the, the mantle that are produced by melting of the mantle. So they can tell us about its thermal state and its composition. So we can imagine uh, we have a plume that is decompressing um, adiabatically. At some point, we will cross the solidus, produce a basaltic melt. And this melt uh, as a composition that is a function of the pressure, temperature, conditions at which it's produced, and also, of course, the composition of what we are melting. So this primary mantle melt in equilibrium with the mantle uh, can sometimes be extracted relatively fast to the surface, or at least to the crust, and form what we call a primitive basalt that is not that different in composition from what we have in the mantle. It's just a little bit maybe of olivine fractionation, uh, but it kind of escapes uh, in a way uh, igneous differentiation. And so those are the type of basalts that we are looking for. Luckily, uh, they are easiest to interpret um, when we're interested in the mantle. And luckily, we, we do have some primitive basalts on Mars. And so here are a few examples. The two on the left are Martian meteorites, uh, the top one is uh, NWA 7034. You might have heard of, of, of it. It's very famous for being old and, and contain class that could be um, uh, coming from the primary crust of Mars. So some of, the, some of its elements are 4.5 billion years old. Uh, the one uh, at the bottom is much younger. It's a shirkotite. It's 200 million years old. And uh, on the right is a basalt that was analyzed in situ by Spirit. Um, and so what those three rocks and all pri primitive basalts have in common is that they contain olivine, they are high in magnesium and they have a high magnesium number, so magnesium over magnesium and iron. So some of the 
uh, hallmarks of uh, primitive basalts. So we have more than just those three. Let's see if I can, yeah. Um, this is the whole list that we used for our most recent uh, paper. And, and you also can notice that they have different crystallization ages that span most of the history of Mars. So we can hope that uh, despite having only uh, 10 or so uh, samples, uh, because they come from different places, different uh, uh, time periods, we can hope to be able to uh, paint some picture of the evolution of, of the mantle uh, through time. So that's the hope, and we'll see uh, later um, what we can and cannot say. Uh, so first, um, what do we do? Yeah, I want to say a little bit, um, I want to uh, go uh, through a couple of techniques that can be used uh, in practice to um, constrain the source of those primitive basalts. And so maybe what is most commonly used is uh, for the inverse approach. And it's summarized very nicely in this uh, volume, basaltic um, um, of the yeah, uh, basaltic volcanism on the terrestrial planets. Um, and here is an application um, for Mars uh, by uh, Justin Filiberto et al. So uh, in this example, um, they use the composition of a bazaar that was analyzed by Spirit uh, called Fastball. So I don't know which one it is, or even if it's on the picture, but it's one of those vesicular bazaars that was analyzed at home plates in, at Gustav Crater. And they took the bulk composition of these basalts. It looked like a you know, rich in magnesium, could be primitive. Um, they did experiments at different pressure temperatures, and then they can um, identify where on the liquidus um, we can reach multi-saturation with olivine and orthoperoxine, so a phase assemblage that um, could be consistent with uh, the mantle, right? In this case, this would be a harsh bijite. Um, and so, yeah, this could tell this could tell you that um, fastball was produced by melting a hospitalite uh, at this pressure and this temperature. Um, so that gives you the mineralogy and the temperature pressure of melting. So we can do that with experiments, but what uh, Filiberto did is also generalize uh, those type of experiments by trying to find the right uh, mineral and melt um, uh, thermometers and, and barometers. Um, that don't require additional experiments, but just rely on, on were parameterized based on existing experiments. And then you can apply those tools to any primitive basalts or basalts that you uh, identify on Mars. And so they did that for a wider range of, of basaltic compositions from Mars. And uh, yeah, taking into account the time at which those basalt crystallized, they try to see if we can see any trend in, in temperature in the mantle over time. This is the type of, um, of um, uh, goal that we are also after. We, we want to do something a little bit similar, but notice here that we have no constraints on the composition of the mantle. And so in order to also be able to say something not only about the temperature, um, but also the composition of the mantle, then we want to use a different approach, which is uh, a direct or forward approach. So the difference here is that instead of starting from the composition of the basalts, we try to guess what could be the composition of the mantle. And then we, we do experiments, different pressure temperature, uh, using here, for example, a primitive mantle from Taibus and Venki. Um, then we analyze the melt that we produce, and, and we see if it matches or not what we observe uh, at the surface on Mars. But of course, this is quite time consuming. And this, you can imagine that um, if we want to identify the source of a specific basalt on Mars, we would need to do a lot of experiments at a lot of different pressure temperature on a lot of different material. And, and that's not super uh, convenient. So instead, we, yeah, we do need uh, some modeling stage. Um, and what has been used um, and that has been applied to Mars to some extent already is Gibbs free energy minimization uh, models, so thermodynamic models like PMELs, maybe the most uh, famous for exp um, igneous petrology. Um, but there are some uh, other tools that has that have become uh, available, um, perplexed with 
uh, new uh, thermodynamic databases and mage main that uses the same uh, thermodynamic databases. In this talk, I'll mostly talk about PMAPs and my own model, uh, which is a bit different, like Mars, but um, yeah, th those alternatives also exist. Okay, so, okay, then, well, can PMELT um, be used to um, simulate partial melting in, in the Martian mantle? And that's uh, a question that um, I, to my knowledge, was uh, first um, um, posed by El Mari, 2009. So the compared um, PMELT simulations here is, for example, the iron content that you produce in, in the melts uh, by melting the mantle with PMELTs. Two early experiments um, on uh, primitive mantle composition of Mars, and, and they decided that, well, we do, we do have a difference, um, but it's, it seems to be relatively constant of three weight with an ion, and maybe we can use PMLs and apply a correction, and it's still good enough for, for our purpose. And so this type of approach has also been used in you know, the studies since then. Um, but when I, I did more experiments at, at more different pressure at different pressures um, from this same primitive mantle composition of Tyrus and Venki, I realized that it was a little bit more complicated than that, and that the offset uh, between the experiments, so here the symbols and PMELs, those lines of different colors that represent different pressures, are not the same at all, all pressures. So at, at 0 0.5 GPA here, PMELs does a very good job at predicting the iron content in, in, in the experimental melts. But at a higher pressure, we start to have larger and larger offsets up to eight weight percent of iron. And you can see, for example, here 2.5 GPA that the offset is, you know, very, it's a function not only of pressure, but also the melt fraction, uh, so the temperature, and it can become really any type of useful correct. Uh, helpful um, and, and, and practical to use for, for the purpose of constraining melting the Martian mantle. So that was the motivation uh, number one for creating MacMars, a more accurate model uh, that can, can be used for Mars. Uh, as I said, there's now other alternatives that I won't talk too much about, but that might be better than PMELTs. Um, but either way, uh, the second motivation for MagMars was to create a model that is simpler than Gibbs free energy minimization models and therefore faster uh, com computationally and that can be easily coupled with uh, thermochemical evolution models, so large uh, convection, uh, 3D convection models. All right, so um, here is how MagMars Mag works um, in, in detail. Uh, as I said, it, it's quite simple. There is um, some theoretical background, um, but it is um, mostly empirical. And the way it works is um, that we have two steps. In step one, we constrain the concentration in the melts of only those um, minor incompatible elements. So uh, to do that, we parameterize um, the partitioning coefficients. Uh, so this is simply the, the ratio of the concentration of an element in a mineral divided by the concentration of the same element in the melt. And because we working mostly with minor elements uh, that are not, that are kind of diluted in, in our silicate melts, we can assume ideality. And in practice, we find that we can parameterize um, those partition coefficients as a simple function of pressure, of, of pressure and temperature, but um, they behave kind of in predictable ways. So we can use an experimental database that is mostly made of exper experiments uh, done on Martian mental compositions. And then we can also parameterize what we still need to solve the batch melting equation, which is the proportion of the minerals in the mantle, the melting reactions, the proportion in which each mineral enters the melt. And that we can also parameterize uh, essentially based on, on pressure uh, from our experiments and the experiments of, of others. So that's step one. Step two is to constrain then the composition of the major oxides, silica, iron, magnesium, calcium. And to do that, we cannot just use um, simple parameterization of the partitioning coefficients, um, um, but we um, can use the Gibbs phase 
phase rule to know exactly how many free parameters we need to fix in order to completely uh, determine the system and know the concentration of the, the major oxide. So in here we see we have five phases, nine elements. So uh, we need to fix six um, free variables that are chosen to be pressure, Mg number, and then the concentration of aluminum, sodium, potassium, and phosphorus that come from step one. So we used, that's why we have steps. Um, we, we need to do step one first, and then we can calculate the concentration of the major oxides. And again, those parameterization uh, rely on, on this same experimental database. All right, so let's see um, how it uh, compares um, to uh, P-melts. So this is the figure I showed you um, previously, comparing the, P, the melts uh, calculated with P-melts at different pressures, um, with the experiments uh, that were done on the same uh, mantle composition. We had those big offsets in iron content, but also in other elements. And with uh, McMarsh, well, we, we do a much better job, thankfully, because we use those experiments in the calibration database, uh, but we do a much better uh, job at predicting the concentration of the melts. So we can use then McMarsh. We are confident that uh, it, it, uh, it works as it should, and we'll apply it to um, a number of Martian basals for, for which we want to um, understand a bit better the, the source. The first example is um, Adirondack, uh, the Adirondack basalts, a set of three basalts that were analyzed at um, Gisef Crater by Spirit. Uh, as I said, those are olivine-rich basalts. You can maybe see the uh, olivine here in, in black, what is thought to be olivine here. Um, and, and because the Mg number is high, we assume that um, this melt, this basalt could be um, a melt uh, in equilibrium with the, with, the, with the Martian mantle of Mg number 75, which is close to what people think the Martian mantle could be. Um, and the Adirondack basalts are quite um, notable for um, being close in composition to the melts uh, that we produce experimentally when we melt the primitive mantle of Mars. And that has been known uh, for a while, actually, as, as soon as those rocks were analyzed, uh, the old experiments of Bertka, Bertka and Holloway um, could be used to realize that, well, those, those basalts are look very much like what you would expect if we were melting the Hybus and Venki Martian mantle. And so that's also what I found when I did more experiments at, at different pressures was that the, the melts um, in the experiment, so those symbols, so those are different oxides. So this is looking at the composition of the melts we produce. The lines are just experimental trends. They're not the model yet. So this is purely exper experimental. And we see that uh, the Adirondack uh, basalt uh, is identical in composition in all uh, oxide spaces to the melts that we produce by melting this prim primitive Martian mantle. One exception is that the Adirondack basalts are actually low in, in potassium, they're poor in potassium. So, okay, may maybe well, it's a bit different. So now we can use the, the model available, McMars, to try to see uh, first if we can um, also reproduce um, the Adirondack basalts using the model, and if we can fix this uh, discrepancy in the potassium content. So mag Mars can be used in different modes, batch, batch melting um, and polybaric uh, fractional melting. So here, this is an example for polybaric fractional melting. So how we, we solve those equations uh, is that we follow um, a mantle uh, that uh, is decompressing adiabatically. It then crosses the liquid, uh, the, sorry, the solidus, and we start to produce melt at different pressures, then we take the average of all of the melt incre increments produced over a range of pressure, and that's the aggregate melt that we look at and see if it, how it compares to the, to the basalts on Mars. So this example here was for primitive mantle composition, the Taiwus and Benki 85 composition, and you see that with 22% of melting over a range of pressure, but an average pressure of 2 GPA, uh, we can produce something close to 
um, the, the, the adiondic basalts. Another way to produce the exact same composition is actually to melt a more depleted mantle at slightly lower temperature and to melt it less, but at the same average pressure of two GPA. So here we only have 5% of melting, but in those two cases, we can produce melt compositions that are nearly identical. And this is what I'm gonna show here. So I'm adding the, what I was showing in the figure on the left is now this uh, green cross. Um, so the, for the primitive mantle and the blue plus is for the figures that I was showing on the right for the depleted source, uh, just those 5% of, of melting. And we see that, okay, they match the composition of the adiondic basalts, as I said, but that the main difference is only the depleted source uh, can uh, produce a basaltic composition that is uh, that has a low potassium sodium uh, ratio. So this is um, from Magmars, the preferred mantle source that we find for the Adirondack basalt that is not the primitive mantles. So the, the primitive mantles are here. Uh, we're looking at the concentration of incompatible elements in the mantle, sodium, aluminum, phosphorus, and also aluminum. Um, and so the, the primitive mantles are here in those gray fields, different models. And when we melt them progressively, well, we lose the incompatible elements. And so the residues follow those trajectories. And we find that the Adirondack source um, look uh, very much like a melting residue uh, that would have lost about 10% of melt during a prior melting event. So we're melting a deeply heat source uh, that is somewhat related to the primitive mantle but that had melt at least twice. First, to become depleted, and then again, to produce the adirondack basalts. So we have this two stage melting, 10% melting, it's about three GPA of a primitive composition followed uh, anytime, anytime after by 5% of melting at a slightly lower pressure and just and with a little bit of olivine fractionation, then that gives you exactly the, the composition of the adirondack basalt. So we can do the same exercise for all of the, composition, the basaltic composition that I listed at the beginning and that are repeated here with different ages. Um, so you see we have different symbols for the same uh, basaltic composition. That's because our solutions are actually not unique and I'll come back to this, but that overall, uh, what we can see from all of those mental sources, from all of those basalts is that the, um, uh, sources are relatively depleted in calcium and aluminum compared to the primitive mantle. So kind of like the Adirondack, the source of the Adirondack basalt here. They all seem depleted in calcium and aluminum. So is it, could it be that it's the same story as for the Adirondack basalt, that all of those mantle sources are some type of melting residues that are then remelting to produce those, those uh, rocks that we sample on, on uh, Mars. Um, so here I'm showing the trajectory um, uh, again um, of, um, of the residues as we melt differently at different pressure, either fractionally or in, at equilibrium, only removing the melt um, once melting is over and either way, Seems like you know it could be could be an explanation that uh, yeah so maybe but let's look at other elements because just two oxide is not really uh, enough <laughs> so if we look at um, the more incompatible elements like sodium and potassium we notice that relative to those trajectories of the of the residues um, many of the metal sources are actually enriched relatively enriched in incompatible elements. Uh, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, and titanium relative to so calcium, aluminium, and, and relative to the primitive mantle. Um, and, and yeah, this is seems to be an observation that we have for a lot of those different mantle sources. Um, and uh, maybe, is it, maybe now is a good time to uh, briefly talk about uh, model uncertainties and non-uniqueness. Um, which is um, substantial. So the, 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 the approach that we use um, is such that if we don't have any other constraints, we just have the composition of the basalt and we don't know the temperature of the mantle or the melt fraction, we will uh, 
by nature have a, a almost unlimited uh, number of um, of mental sources here those yellow dots uh, that can reproduce almost identical melt compositions just a different melt fraction uh, and, so, and so on um, but uh, you see that despite this uncertainty and non-uniqueness uh, so the contour here is the, um, the parameter space that we that we uh, uh, search um, automatically um, and and the solutions here are yeah, those, those yellow uh, open circles. So despite um, this wide range of possible mental compositions, we see that all of them are more enriched in incompatible elements um, than the, the trajectory of residual um, mantles. Um, OK, so uh, what, what could be the, the origin now of this relative enrichment of incompatible elements? And, I have to say that this discussion is, is highly speculative and um, qualitative because due to the non-uniqueness and modern uncertainties, I did not, I was not confident to, to um, uh, have this discussion in a more quantitative way. But a couple of processes that could explain an enrichment in incompatible elements. Um, the first one is maybe just the, the, the magma uh styles in the, in the crust somewhere that is rich uh in in those incompatible elements and we just contaminate the primary mantle melt by uh, a crystal component and i mean it it could be of course but uh, because we are dealing with um primitive basalt that are rich in uh mgo we, we don't think that's the case uh, because this process of assimilation and fractional crystallization should simultaneously uh, lower the, the MGO content of, of the melts by uh, fractionation of olivine. So we uh, put that aside for now. Um, another process is mental metasomatism. So maybe we had depleted residues that were rejuvenated, refertilized by fluids or, or melts. And that's a process that has been su suggested, for example, for nacolites. Uh, they are believed to be um, to come from the melting of um, a rejuvenated uh, a lithospheric mantle. And that's actually consistent with, with our Magmars uh, simulation for nacolites. We see, we find a mantle source that is rich in potassium and relatively poor in other elements like phosphorus and titanium. I can quickly go back here. Um, yeah, you see for the, the chassinite, uh, um, we don't see an enrichment in phosphorus, but we see an enrichment in sodium and especially potassium that is not represented here. Um, but for um, the, um, the other mantle sources, uh, it doesn't seem to work because those are also rich in, in phosphorus or, and titanium, which are not as mobile in fluid. Or if it is some type of metasomatism, then it has to involve some, some silicate melts that carry those elements uh, more easily. Okay, so one last process that could explain this relative enrichment. Um, is the um, fractional crystallization of the Martian magma ocean. So we think that there has been a magma ocean on Mars that uh, might have created a lot of different mental reservoirs. And, and we know that from um, isotopic studies on, on, on Mars, Martian meteorites. We, have, we seem to have a very old uh, reservoir that separated early. And, and maybe this is also what we are seeing in, in, uh, in the minor incompatible elements. So how would that work? Well, uh, let's imagine we first crystallize uh, uh, rig rig rigwoodite and majorite. We can lock in a lot of the aluminum in, in majorite. Um, so the aluminum decreases uh, in, in the residual melts. We can lock in calcium in some mid layers that are rich in clinal peroxine and, and towards the end, but not the very end, so just towards the end, we end up with a melt that is not that enriched in, as in aluminum calcium, but that is, that is getting more and more enriched in the incompatible elements. So, you know, this is all very qualitative and uh, yeah, a lot more work has to be done uh, to test this model. But this could explain um, also the chemical diversity that we see. So this is all I can say um, for the composition of the mental sources of Martian basalts. And in the last part of this talk, I'll just talk about um, the temperature 
of the different mental reservoirs um, that uh, we constrain with those same uh, NightMars uh, simulations. So here, um, again, organized um, uh, based on when the different basalts crystallize. I, I put those, those new constraints that we obtain. Uh, we always have to make an assumption on uh, what's the MG number of the, of the source. So that's more of an assumption, but we can see even with very uh, different uh, mental MG number, we have a relatively constant uh, potential temperature in the mental true time um, between 14 and 15 Celsius degrees. So this might seem a bit surprising. Why doesn't it decrease? Um, so yeah, Filiberto observes that um, the potential temperature of, of, of the sample decreases. And intuitively, maybe that's what we should expect. The secular cooling of the planet, the, the, the mantle is uh, getting cooler and cooler uh, with time. Um, but let's see if we can add a little bit more constraints here and, and clarify the, the, the situation. So one more source of information we can use is um, not this time um, rover in-situ analysis or meteorites, but uh, regional uh, estimation of the, of the composition of volcanic prov provinces by gamma ray spectroscopy. So this is data from a Mars Odyssey. And um, so I'm going to use here two uh, studies, Amari and Baratu et al. 2011, which is similar. Uh, and Mary, they looked mostly at one volcanic province, uh, Tarsis Rice, where they include all of those volcanoes and, and, and volcanic plains. And uh, Baratu, they divided uh, a little bit um, the volcanic provinces, um, and they also tried to organize uh, them based on age. So on, in blue, we have the old ones, Hesperian volcanic provinces in uh, red, we have the younger Amazonian volcanic provinces. And so let's try to see if we can use those compositions uh, and magmars to say something about the temperature of the mantle at those locations. So in many ways, this is just redoing uh, those two studies, uh, but using magmars instead of PMELs uh, for the reasons that I highlighted uh, at the beginning, PMELs might not be uh, the most accurate tool um, and so, yeah, uh, Elmari used mostly tarsis um, rice, which is which is also which is composed of Olympus Mons and other volcanoes uh, listed here. But you see the compositions are are the same. Um, I'll, maybe I'll just go to the next slide. It's it's a bit better for what I want to explain. So, uh, okay, how do those how do those figures work. Um, we um, so Elmari in this case on the left ran uh, p melts at different pressures using the Hybus and Benke 85 mantle compositions, and we see trajectories in in the melt composition in iron and silica. Um, so the number here represents the melt fraction, and they say okay maybe this Tarsis rise uh, region. Uh, represents a melt that was produced at 17 uh, kilobars in the mantle and, and it represents a 5% melt. But the problem is that when we try to do the same with MacMars, which is more accurate, uh, we actually do not reproduce those compositions at all. We do reproduce pretty well the um, Asperian volcanic provinces and, and Elysium and some of the other uh, Amazon Amazonian volcanic provinces, but Tarsis, um, and here we, we don't reproduce. Um, okay, so how can we then explain those compositions? We can try to melt a mantle that is more magnesium rich. So here we use two uh, newer uh, models for the mantle of Mars that are more magnesium rich, the Yoshizaki and Magdana 2020 and Ken and Al 2022. And of course, the, the less iron rich, actually, the easier it is to um, reproduce than uh, Olympus uh, Mons. So this could mean, yeah, that the source underneath Olympus Mons and Tarsis in general is more uh, magnesium rich. And this could go along with the fact that chagotites um, that are also relatively magnesium rich could come from, from this region. 
but anyway, uh, we can look at those new um, temperature constraints that we gained from the gamma ray uh, volcanic provinces. Uh, so this was the work of Bahatu, and I'm reinterpreting uh, the, the, yeah, I recalculated the potential temperature using MacMars and different mantle compositions. And so well, we, we still see um, a lot of variability in the, in the potential temperature, not, not a clear temporal evolution, but if we assume that the mantle is on average magnesium rich, um, then maybe uh, there is a decrease uh, in temperature that we see among the, the volcanic provinces. So to try to help us a little bit to understand this data, uh, we compared it to uh, 3D um, uh, planetary scale convection model, so ther thermochemical evolution model by Plaza et al, um, which incorporates some of the recent uh, constraints from inside. And um, I'm showing on this figure here uh, in gray the area of the mantle at any given time that is affected by partial melting. Um, so we see that a lot of different uh, mantle regions melt at, at quite different temperatures all over um, the history of the planet. And even though uh, the mantle is cooling over time, it might not be obvious if you just happen to sample anywhere here in, in the middle of this range. So in, in other words, um, what we're seeing here uh, could be a sample bias that um, is still compatible with the secular cooling of the mantle over time, and that might also be uh, shown by the gamma ray uh, volcanic provinces here. Okay, <laughs> I might be confusing, but you can ask uh, clarifying questions uh, at the end. I'm almost done. Um, so I also have stars here, and those stars. Uh, they represent in the thermochemical evolution model of Plezite al the specific locations with, where we think that those basalts um, might um, come from, um, the, the, the temperature, so at this specific time and place. And that's why I'll show you now, okay, two maps. One map, so those are the maps that we get from the thermochemical evolution model. Um, and at uh, Gusev crater 3.7 uh, billion years, um, the temperature was of the mantle underneath was about um, yeah, 15, uh, 15, 20 Celsius degrees. And much, much later, uh, 0.5, um, uh, 0.5 uh, DA, uh, at what could be the, the source location of depleted chalotides, the potential temperature was actually the same. So even though we have, of, obviously this is clear from this, those two images, the mantle that is cooling significantly over time, we still have regions that experience melting at the same temperature. And so this might just be, as I said, uh, that we just happen to sample uh, those uh, places. Uh, okay, I'm adding one last figure here on the right. Um, which is the same for the same data set, uh, looking at the pressure of melting this time instead of the temperature of melting all the time. And again, we don't really see a clear temporal evolution, which I don't know, we, we don't really know what to make of it. Um, but um, we also see that uh, the source of charlatites, the, if we compare it to where the mantle is melting uh, at this time, well, this, the source of charlatites seem to be in the lithospheric mantle, but that, yeah, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And so what we think is that the chagotides melt are actually produced uh, relatively deep, but that they re-equilibrate uh, in the lithospheric mantle, uh, maybe at the base of the Tarsis crust. And, and this is the, the final signature of the melt is actually records this shallower pressure that is not the pressure of melting. Okay, so I am done. Uh, I see I have a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll read uh, the, the summary for you. Um, so yes, we created uh, this new uh, melting model that we called Mike Mars that uh, we developed specifically to simulate Martian, uh, sorry, melting of the Martian mantle. And we find that it's more uh, accurate than, than P-melts. 
and also faster and easier to use, I would say. Um, that's debatable. <laughs> but um, many of the, the sources that we then constrain using magmars, they appear to be depleted in calcium and aluminum relative to the primitive mantle. So for example, adirondack basalts uh, could represent a, a residual mantle that, that melted twice uh, to produce uh, uh, the adirondack basalts. Some of the other sources, uh, while they are also uh, depleted in calcium and aluminum, they are relatively enriched in incompatible elements. And this could be due to uh, a range of uh, different processes from uh, mantle refertilization by fluids or melts or some um, inheritance from the crystallization of the magma ocean. It's, it's still not 100% not clear. Um, and on, in terms of the pressure and temperature melting conditions, um, we see a lot of variability, uh, no clear uh, evolution with time, but that despite this variability, um, it might not be surprising that we stand samples without represent perfectly how the, the mantle uh, cooled with time, but that um, the, the overall um, the, the constraints that we have are still in, a, in agreement with uh, predictions from thermochemical evolution models. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Max. Now it's time for questions from our participants. So feel free to open your mic, or you could leave a question in the chat, and I could ask a question on your behalf. So go ahead. So there's one question from Trendel. So, so the Mark McMars can be applied to calculate the samples in PT, uh, such PNT of the primary uh, uh, primary basalts on the Earth. So, so yeah, yeah uh, I, 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 I think I think he means two questions. That can this be applied to the Earth? And second, mm -hmm. that can trace elements uh, simulation yeah. be included in future no, versions yeah, of that? So, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm reading a question. Uh, no, great question. Thank you. Um, so I originally just made Mike Mars with you know Mars in mind, but I still included um, um, some um, actually a good amount of experiments that are made on uh, Mars, uh, sorry, tertial mantles in, in the database to really anchor the 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 model towards those more magnesium rich um, com composition. And then I tried to yeah reproduce some um, um, experiments that were done on on the terrestrial mantle with magmars, and I was actually surprised to see that it does um, a very decent job. Um, I'm not saying it's the best model to simulate a melting of the Earth mantle, but it's not ridiculous at all. And uh, I'm actually using it now for uh, for Venus also uh, as one tool. Of course, I'm also always comparing with other uh, thermodynamic models available, but it can be used. Yeah, it's not ridiculous uh, for 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 the years. Uh, trace elements, not yet. Uh, that's something I I'm hoping to add um, in a, in, a, in the next version. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll see how fast I can I can get to that. Uh, Hello, Mike. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Can I, I missed the, uh, the beginning. Uh, is it based on the... uh, Sorry, Chow, I, I don't think we can hear you very well. Could you yeah. repeat the question? Could you put your microphone closed to, to your mouth and then repeat the question? I didn't hear the question. was not perfect yeah sorry can, can you guys hear me? uh i think i could, could yeah. try could you try your question again okay. um it doesn't no. work very well now uh, sorry. 
Yeah. Uh, Chao, we, we cannot hear you. Uh, so, so Max, did, did you hear the question? Uh, I didn't hear the question. I didn't hear it either. Maybe you can write it down. Okay. Okay. Okay, Chao, would, would you mind writing your question down? Uh, and yeah. then I, I, I think. So 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 as a following question of the trend house that um I think the reader paper you have a MATLAB version I think uh so so for the Python version I don't know the uh let's say oh, what's this current situation for the Python version of the Mac Mars um yeah there is no Python version uh the only let's say free uh way uh, to use Mac Mars would then to use Octave um uh, so this alternate to to matlab we tested um we tested uh the model with octave uh and, and it works it's a bit slower um i yeah i also would like to um uh, have a python version and uh i yeah i've been busy with other other projects but um i i um i think i will also or some or someone else um, uh, could uh, try to convert it. I think it, it should be relatively easy. It's not. It's not a. It's it's not a huge uh, model. So, um, yeah, I think it could. It's a good point. We, we probably should do that, and might increase the interest in the model as well. Okay. So, child question is uh, about the oxygen frigacity. So, do you consider the effects of oxygen frigacity in your modeling? Uh, no, uh, no, because. Um, we just um use um yeah it's it's not an independent constraint it's just whatever oxygen fugacity was used in the experiments that we use and usually those experiments are all done in graphite capsules at similar pressures and are assumed to be close to um qfm minus two or three um, so that's kind of also the effort to that the model should uh, uh, simulate, but it's not. It's there's no there's no way to deviate uh, from that. Uh, so I see one more question. Uh, could you so, so, the more, so yeah, the question about the pressure. So does the pressure represent mm. the pressure of the primary melt that it is generated? Mm, yeah, the pressure. I get confused with uh, what pressure. How does the pressure that we um, use at which we calculate um, the melt? Um, what does it relate to uh, physically? Because of course that's the pressure at which um, uh, the model is is melting um, uh, the composition of the mantle that we that we chose. Now, that's assuming that there's no re-equilibration re um, during magma ascent and. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I think there's some debate about um, what happens during magma ascent, and and it can be partial recalibration. And there seem to be, I mean, what what we see um, here, and and the fact that um, uh, we record such shallow pressures um, at at a time where um, we expect the lithosphere to be thick, um, to me tells me that uh, the pressure that we record, at least in those cases, is not the, um, the primary uh, pressure at, at which the, the melt was generated, um, but it's kind of overprinted. It's kind of like the, the re-equilibration of the melt at these pressure is, is overprinting the, the, the chemistry of the melt. Um, and I don't know what if that's the case generally uh, for all of the samples, or if it's just something that happens uh, Underneath those big volcanoes that are Tarsis and and essentially uh, yeah the Tarsis uh, region, um, yeah I'm not sure, <laughs> but thanks for the question. 
So, so actually, uh, I have a question. Uh, so in your model, in having considered water, so water affects uh, solidus. So there, I, re I recall there was a work by Zeph and uh, Quentin Williams at uh, UCSC that uh, in their case, they didn't do this, but, but they did the crystallization of magma motion Mars and they considered the water content uh, evolution uh, in the magma Mars uh, on Mars. Uh, no, but I think I recall that what they did was using MELS, um, uh, the three GPA. So, so, so what's, what's your comment on, on the role of water here? That they might play uh, and oh, the that's... impacts on your current model. Ah, that's interesting. I'm not sure I know that. what study uh, were you referring to with uh, the effect of water during magma ocean crystallization? Uh, Zeph and uh, Quentin Williams, uh, 2019 ah. at GRL. Yeah, ah. research letters. Yeah, you yeah. know, no, yeah. okay, I, I vaguely remember that paper. I don't remember yeah, yeah. So well, the conclusions. Be, 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 because, because their work they show that uh, during mm -hmm. the crystallization, the residual melt. Uh, in the mega motion are really iron rich. So they propose that those uh, uh, ideal rich uh, melt, which could be basaltic composition on Mars, that sinks to the bottom of the magma, uh, right. sink, sink into the bottom of the mantle and likely stay at the Martian core mountain boundary. So that's uh, what they propose, but I think it plays a role for water there uh, yeah. for stability of the melt. Yeah, it's okay. Well, yeah, it's it's hard, of course, for me to say. Even when we think of the crystallization of the magma ocean, the, there are so many parameters that that we that, that we can tweak and 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 produce a lot of different uh, products. Um, of course, the effect of water is is interesting uh, during the crystallization of the magma ocean and also afterwards uh, remelting of the mantle, because there must be some water absolutely um, in 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 the mantle. So the model doesn't really, it's not that it, that it doesn't have water at all. It's just when we do experiments, as you might know, there are always a little bit of water that we can't completely eliminate. Um, so the the way I like to think of the water in, in this model is like, okay, imagine there's 50 ppm of water in the mantle, that's, that's low. And that could be in agreement with some estimates of the uh, how much water you have on Mars um, uh, in, in the mantle, but it doesn't say anything about how much water you had um, during magma ocean crystallization. It could be much higher. Um, so yeah, I mean, for all of those type of processes, unfortunately, um, yeah, the, the, the model uh, magma um, is not as uh, helpful. Um, but I think that I recall that um, that study uh, that that you uh, that you're talking about. They use PMLs. And the part of the reason why they find that the melts are so iron rich is because it's kind of an inter, um, artifact of, of P melts. Um, so, um, yeah, it would be interesting to use some of the um, more recent, I uh, didn't have time to talk about it, but this perplex uh, uh, with the new database of Holland et al., uh, Tom, Tomlinson uh, et al., uh, uh, that can be used for any processes like magma ocean crystallization that is better than PMELs. So yeah, I would be curious to see a repeat of that study uh, with um, um, uh, those other tools because PMELs just doesn't really um, cut it, uh, in my opinion. Okay, uh, any more questions? Okay, I think it's a good webinar. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks our speaker again, and thanks everyone for your participation. So before we end the webinar, so uh, uh, Max, could you turn your uh, screen sharing off? Of course. And then yes. everyone, could you open your video and then show a smile for, for your appreciation <laughs> for our speaker today? So I'm going to turn the uh, meeting off in about 30 seconds. So. Everyone, thank uh, you, everyone, for attending. Show your smell. Thank you so much. Feel free to contact me with any questions if you want copies of the papers, including the paper that 
is not out yet. I'm happy to provide that. And thank you for your time today and for the invitation. Bye. Yeah, Max, I think that maybe we could also collaborate on the writing of Python version. Uh, I plan to uh, recruit students working on Python here because we, we, we develop a, a Python uh, framework called the GeoCapture mm -hmm. Pi that could use machine uh, automatic tuning uh, for machine learning uh, mm -hmm. working on geochemical data. And we also try to work on some other, uh, let's say, refined uh, modeling tools and by also translating into Python. So I think we yeah. can talk about that at some point. Yeah, um, no, I mean, if, if yeah. you have mm -hmm. yeah, the, the mm -hmm. wants uh, and, and the mm -hmm. needs, um, I don't think it's that much work. It's just that, yeah, yeah you could not, could not find the time, but it should be relatively easy to do. Yeah, it's a good, yeah. uh, great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.